Lee's character. I don't know what it means. Uh, maybe it's the name of a city. It's probably, it's, yeah, it's probably, I probably picked it up in some city as a tourist uh, souvenir or something. Because <clears throat> I, I needed a sun hat. <laughs> so now I need it as a light hat. Uh, to protect uh, to protect my eyes from the glare of the ceiling light. Okay, <clears throat> now this uh, second topic, so 0 0.2 in the text, uh, we, we now start on the actual course work, um, now doing into the details, the nitty gritty as, as I call it, and we will start learning the prerequisites, remember this is chapter 0, the introduction, uh, we're learning the tools and the notations and so forth that we will use in the three parts to follow. So uh, this is 0 0.2 here, like the second block of uh, chapter 0, is on uh, mathematical notations and terminology, or notions, sorry, notions, um, you know, basic mathematical tools. And we will start with sets, and, uh, and in uh, session four, uh, we'll do sequences and tuples. And so uh, for the next ooh, quite a few sessions, uh, it'll be basically math, right? Um, techniques on how to prove things, you know, proof techniques, uh, stuff like that. Um, all right. So, uh, so, so expect from now on. For uh, quite a few weeks, I guess, it'll just be math, math tools that you will need for, um, well, especially part two on uh, computer, computer theory and analyzing Turing machines. Uh, now, especially in the next few sessions when we talk about proof techniques, you know, various, various ways to prove things, to prove uh, quasi-mathematical theorems, uh, because uh, you'll be warned, uh, a lot of this text, especially the later parts, uh, the more difficult parts, get very pure math-like. Uh, perhaps I should say, uh, now I've, you know, I've, taught, I've taught this course at uh, senior and master's level, two times, three times, forgetting. Uh, in the US and in China. Now, uh, the first time I taught it was in America, when I was a professor in America. Uh, it was to a master's class, and they, you know, that, that was a master's class, right? So they, I had no dropouts. Well, except maybe one or two at the very beginning, the first week, because yeah, they decided to do something else. But uh, I didn't have any dropouts, uh, purely because the course was hard. But in China, uh, I, I had a mixed class for some reason. It was more decision of the dean, which I think was a mistake. Anyway, uh, I had a mixed class of seniors, uh, so undergrads, and uh, first year master's students. Now, I didn't have any dropouts from the master's students. They were self-motivated. But uh, about a quarter or a third, even, of the undergrads dropped out. Right when. Um, when it got to the sort of master level uh, pure math type proofs of uh, computability, you know, it, it, it is non-trivial. Um, computer, well, theory of computation has the reputation in computer science of being pretty well the toughest subject you know, in terms of mathematical abstraction. And, uh, so, uh, you know, one, one of the reasons I've been including it in, in this Degaris MPC series is that it's pure math, right? Um, it's the sort of thing that appeals to mathematically oriented uh, pure math, well, obviously pure mathematicians and mathematical physicists, you know, physicists who, who like math very much. So uh, the pure math element of theory of computation will appeal to them. All right. So expect uh, expect quite a bit of math over the next the next few weeks. And expect over the next month or two, especially when we get into uh, proving theorems about computability or uncomputability, uh, you know, it gets it gets quite abstract. 
And you know, I had I remember these these undergrads uh, coming up to me just saying, oh, oh, "Professor, it's too hard. I, I I just can't follow it." I'm I'm and like halfway through the course, right? Halfway, and uh, they they just uh, they just dropped out, and and then did you know, did something else they felt that they could do. So uh, it's it's not for nothing that I classify this course as a, a mix senior level M1 level. But if you're senior level, you it's probably a good thing that you're you see yourself as a a, a future let's say M1 level student um, in many universities. The proportion, the fraction of students who move on from bachelor level to become master students uh, depends on the university but I know just guessing based on the two, two three universities I've taught at uh, somewhere between a tenth and a fifth something like that so you know, 10 20 percent of bachelor students go on to become masters so they're different definitely a brighter bunch and a similar uh, selection uh, effect between uh, master's level and PhD. Uh, see, PhD students, uh, what are they? Well, they're future researchers and professors. You know, a lot of them go on to become professors if, if they're enough jobs. That's the hard part. So, uh, uh, so when, when, I, when I come to the difficult proofs, I will pitch those proofs at master's level, okay. Um, now that's a choice on my part. You may ask, why am I doing that? Why don't, why don't I sort of try to make it understandable, more understandable to uh, senior level students? And that seems like a reasonable claim. Uh, and I probably will. I'll probably compromise to some extent, try to make it as clear as possible. But some things are just intrinsically difficult to understand. Right? It's just the nature of uh, the topic. Or, or you know, some proofs are just difficult, and they they demand a higher level of IQ, higher intelligence to follow them. And so, uh, you know, some things you just cannot dumb down, so to speak. So uh, when I, when I sense that that's the case, that uh, something's just intrinsically difficult, you know, I'll try I'll try to be as clear as I can. Uh, but uh, you know, if if you find it heavy going, um, well maybe uh, you know, this course is not for you. That's that's a possibility. Now what I've just said, uh, that comment will apply increasingly as if, if you follow if, if you, you keep following me for, for years uh, at higher and higher levels, right? Uh, my intention is to go right up to um, PhD two level. You know, second year classes of uh, PhD level. So uh, you know by then the the pure math, the math physics is very difficult. So uh, those classes uh, I I'll be pitching at PhD two level, assuming that you, you, know, you you've got the nous the, the IQ to be a PhD student. Right? And remember this these lectures go to YouTube, the whole planet. Right? So, uh, you know, I'm hoping there'll be thousands of students or more uh, who choose to, uh, to you know, teach, teach yourselves at, uh, at these graduate levels. That's, that's the whole point of uh, the, you know, well, I haven't really talked about it, when, but one of my motives uh, in teaching graduate level courses for free is um, I'm trying to counter a very powerful influence in societies. I mean, if you think about it, most people are peakers. I call them peakers um, because if you look at the bell curve, you know, the probability distribution of intelligence, you know, IQs over the whole population, uh, you get a bell curve, uh, a, a Gaussian normal distributed curve. It looks like a bell, bell shaped. And uh, two thirds of the population lie within uh, one plus or minus one standard deviation, an SD, of the average or the mean as it's called, uh, you know, the, the top, the peak of the bell curve. So the peakers 
uh, by definition, they're the people I label whose IQ lies within plus or minus one standard deviation around the mean, or the average value, which is 100. So two-thirds of the population have an IQ between 85 and 115. Uh, typically, standard devi deviation 15 points. Okay. Now, uh, that being so, that two-thirds of the population are like that, then so much of daily life is geared to the peakers. I mean, think about it. The ads on television, they're, they're aimed at peakers because they're the majority. Uh, pop music, it, well, it may be popular with peakers, but personally, I hate pop music. I despise it. It, it lacks the genius and beauty of what I call real music. Like, I mean, how can you compare, for example, Elvis Presley, you know, pop music, with, say, Gustav Mahler? I uh, love Mahler, despise pop music. So, uh, you know, stuff like that. So, so much of our culture is geared towards the peakers. But now, with uh, a tripod, a camcorder, a whiteboard, it's possible for individuals, you know, single people like like myself, you know, to uh, to to be empowered to present material at definitely non-peaker level uh, to people I call the the alphas. So uh, most of my lectures will be aimed at alphas. And what's an alpha? That's somebody by definition who's IQ, intelligence, is in the top percentile, in the top 1% of the population. And uh, at the very highest levels, uh, say PhD 2 level, um, it gets you know, it gets really tough. And then I'm probably pitching more at the what I call the sages. So a sage is uh, 1 in a 1,000 rather than 1 in a 100. A sage, I assume, well, by, by definition, is uh, satisfies four criteria. Criteria uh, is an alpha, you know, top percentile of intelligence, uh, has a PhD, or working working that way, uh, has ideas, and writes books about them, or wants to plans to write books about them. So, um, at PhD two level, I'd be pitching not just at alphas but uh, people who, whose ambition is to become sages. Like they may want to become university professors or researchers or write, writers of technical books and, and so forth. So people like that uh, are, have largely been ignored and they have a hard time, they feel alienated in uh, a pico a pico de culture because uh, they're, not, they're not catered to. So part of my motivation is to provide material for free to the alphas and later to the sages. So. All right, so uh, I'll start uh, the next session on the nitty gritty and I'll start with sets, you know, like the definition, you know, what is a set? Well, just a, <laughs> this is confusing here, a group has a technical meaning in group theory, but. Uh, in the man in the street definition, it's just a group of objects, a group of things that you see as a whole, as a unit. Right? So, so just think of it as a, a bunch of objects, a bunch of things that you think as a unit. It's a very vague definition, but uh, you have to start somewhere with definitions. You can define something in terms of something else, and you can define the something else in terms of something else again, but eventually you have to stop somewhere, right? You start with a, a given, your premises. So, uh, in mathematics, uh, a set is just about as basic as you can get. So, uh, we'll just define a set as just be, you know, some group of objects that you, you treat as a, a unit that you can give a label to. Oh, stop there.